Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here and it's time for part 5 of the Monday Q&A. The final part and I'm so glad I'm almost done. Although I should have tacked on to that last question on part 4. You also need to make sure you're eating enough calories. You don't eat enough, you can forget uh, preserving lean muscle mass on endurance training. But first question here. What's the best way to get maximum leg development without squats due to hip issues? I have problems doing squats pain free but want some tree trunks for legs. Well, you need to find the style of squat that doesn't hurt your hips because any big multi-joint movement is going to potentially put the exact same stressors on your hips that the regular barbell squat does. It's unavoidable. Any form of leg press or anything you do is still stressing the hips and you're still going to have to find the stance and the toe position and the heel position and everything that minimizes that pain in your hips that you would on a squat. So, and you're not going to build good legs off of uh, leg extensions and leg curls. You're just not. They're not going to have big tree trunk legs, that's for sure. So no matter what route you go, you're going to have to figure out how to perform it uh, to be pain free on your hips. And if you can figure it out on one exercise, you can figure it out on another. So you'd still be able to do it on the squats. I am going to recommend that you go back to a high bar style squat with a fairly narrow stance if you're having hip issues because wide stance squatting, particularly ultra wide stance squatting, does put more wear and tear on your hips. So you're going to need to find the squat style or leg press style or whatever exercise you're doing. that It's going to work for your, your hips and work around your injury or inflammation or whatever it is that you have. All right, next question. How do rugby players debut one year fucking small, the next year come back and they're monsters and pass the drug tests? It's the same thing I've told you guys for years, drug tests don't work. In fact, if you guys recall, I did a video back on the original Ice Cream Fitness when someone had asked me about this stuff where I wrote how to use Mr. Olympia, like IFBB Pro size doses. I wrote out a full blast that somebody could run 11 months out of the year and walk in and pass the drug test at an event. So a pre-planned drug test, only a moron could fail it. As far as even random testing, a lot of these athletes go through, this stuff is a lot easier to get around than you realize. That's how they do it. They're, they can use drugs and get away with it. It just isn't that hard there are so many methods out there to bypass testing and they change from year to year because the quality and level of the testing changes and then the coaches and the doctors and everyone else have to adjust accordingly. But yes, if I know the parameters of a test, what sort of testing an athlete is subject to, I can get an athlete through random drug testing. I used to do it for money. So to answer your question is because the drug testing doesn't work. And the owners and the officials involved in these sports know that and they need it to be that way because nobody in this world wants clean athletes. It's not fun to watch true naturals actually compete at the high level in sports because they suck. We want super humans. That's what entertains us. That's what keeps breaking the records. That's what the spectators want to see. And the team owners and the officials know that and they do their best to fight to make sure that the drug tests stay just easy enough that they don't have to work as hard to get through them because it ends up costing the players and the athletes a lot of money to get to bypass it and a lot of work to bypass it when they get too strict usually when they get caught it's because they're stupid and they screw up and they don't carry the one when they're doing their addition and I, i'm serious it's actually that's what happens they just get lazy and mess up on the math that's when they get caught all right, next question and last question of the week. Could you address how a natural power lifter should refeed after the weigh-ins for an IPF like meat? Uh, two hour weigh-ins. Well, going back to the other thing, a lot of IPF guys, the IPF is full of drugs. However, the big difference, the big difference is that even if the guys in the IPF are using drugs, they're generally clean in the final hours before the meet. So, well, even if they use something in the past, your point is still valid about natural. They're not, they don't have much in the way of nutrient partitioning uh, agents that they can use other than maybe insulin. 
after their weigh-in. And I'm not going to discuss with you guys how to use insulin after this, even though it will fly right through the drug testing. You, you guys can figure it out on your own. I don't give insulin advice. But it's very simple. If you're saunaing and everything, you can really, really run into a lot of problems with a two-hour weigh-in. You could really hammer your performance. But we have seen IPF guys come in and drop 15 or 20 pounds on a two-hour weigh-in, regain their weight, and compete and set records. It has happened. And a lot of it has to do with their carb depleting, depleting all their glycogen stores. They don't necessarily water fast. A lot of them will just up their water intake dramatically the week going in, rip those carbs down rock bottom, and then just cut the water back the final day rather than water fast because they've adapted to the much higher water intake. So that's what I would do. And then when they hit the scale, what they can actually start doing before they step on the scale, if they've cut the water intake back just enough, they can start consuming pretty much dry sugar and some dry carbs a few hours before the weigh-in to get some glucose back into their system. As long as they're not putting fluid back in, they're not going to regain the weight immediately. But they so they'll start a dry carb but before step on the scale and then they sugar load and fluid load and electrolyte load like crazy and not necessarily whole food you want it's liquid at that point liquid calories liquid calories but they've got to practice this ahead of time because if they mess up the electrolyte balance will get diarrhea and if you're getting diarrhea you're not going to be setting any records in on your squats so it's something someone has to really practice to get good at for the two-hour weigh-ins. They don't have the leeway that we have in the 24-hour weigh-ins. But yes, it can be done, it has been done, and it will be done again in the future. So it does require a lot more prep. Like for us with the 24-hour weigh-ins, we can do the same thing with less work and less practice. With the two-hour weigh-ins, you've got to have that stuff honed to a perfect skill and you better know your body. And how it's going to respond when all those electrolytes and that fluid hit it. But if you can figure that out, that's that's basically how you would do it. And it works. All right, guys. So that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it has been informative. And I will talk to you guys next time. But let me give you guys a bicep shot before I go. Oh, Mount Bicepius.